So look at this. Look at this, guys. Let me, let me, let me, let me. I want to talk now really briefly about an identity you can chill with. An identity you can chill with. And I'm still in Exodus. I'm loving on Exodus tonight. I'm in Exodus chapter 16 now. And I'm going to read for you verses 4 and 5. I'm in Exodus 16 verses 4 and 5. Hear, hear what the rich, wonderful, sweet word of God says. Exodus 16, 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain, what is that? Bread. Bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. How often? Every day. Every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my law. In my law. And it will come about on the, what day is that? Six. Six. On the sixth day, when they have prepared what they have brought in, it will be how many times? Twice, Twice as much as they gather daily. daily. Now look at this. The children of Israel are in slavery in Egypt. They are second class citizens. In fact, worse than that. You know, you know like how we how we talk about like Mexicans? No, Especially no. those that you know probably would are, are here without documentation and so on. The Israelites were worse than that. They were immigrants. And, and let me just say this. Let me let me just say that. I don't want to be political. Right? <coughs> but the people that should the, the, the people that should be the least xenophobic. Xenophobia means fear of strangers. The people that should love and support immigrants more than any people on the planet is people who celebrate the Sabbath. Because in the Sabbath commandment, it says, and the stranger that is within thy gates. I don't know if you ever read that. And the foreigner, the alien that is within thy gate. And I know this is not just an American thing. But in every country, every country that is somewhat developed, like in my country, we have oil. So people from the other islands, they would come for a better life in Trinidad. And the Trinidadians would treat them with scorn and derision. Second class citizens. The Israelites were that. Second class. They were nobody. They were the butt of the jokes. They were, and, 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 and you know, as, as the, because they were in slavery, all they knew was the Egyptian economy, which meant if they didn't work, they did not eat. If they didn't work, they got beaten. You know what I mean? They were less than, than humans. Huh? And, and what, what made it worse is their identity or their understanding of God began to get eroded. And let me explain why. Back in those days, whichever nation was the dominant nation, that nation's God was the mighty God. So that's why it was so comical when, when the dude who was in charge of the slaves rolls up on the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, and says to him, Yo, God says, let my people go. I'm surprised Pharaoh didn't laugh in his face. You mean the slave God? That weak God whose people is in slavery is talking to us who have the dominant God? And we had a world power. So, so not only were the Israelites humiliated, not only were they belittled, but even their sense of identity was pretty shattered. So what does God do to show them that they are loved, that they are precious, that they are somebody? What does God do to, 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 to speak into their hearts and into their spirits that they are important, that they are, they are valuable? How, how does God do that? Well, you know, he delivers them, right? And, and right, listen, man, one of the sweetness of understanding the Bible is its comedy. So I'm not funny accidentally. I, I, I get my humor from the Bible. Because we hear what God does. All the things they worship, he plagued they worship the night, he turned it to blood. Mm -hmm. They worship the sun, it went dark. Go worship that now. You know what I mean? It was just comical. It's just powerful. So he, he blows the place up. 
delivers his people. They walk through dry land. So when they're walking through the Red Sea, right, on both sides of them, the, the water is stacked up like a wall, right? So he brings them out. That's, that's not the big miracle. He showed them he was deliverer. But how does God show them that he cares for them? That he infinitely cares for them? You know what God does? You know what God does? Remember, they came from a place where they had to work to survive. Where their identity was only in their work of slavery. You all are getting this? Mm -hmm. all are getting this? Is it making sense? Mm -hmm. So what does God do to show them he loves them? What does God do to restore an identity in them, to let them know they're awesome and they're favored? He gives them rest. He gives them a holiday every single week. He feeds them with angels' food, according to Psalm 78. He feeds them with bread from heaven. This is manna. Food will just fall from heaven. And these jokers will just go out, scoop it up, and eat. But you know, there will always be greedy people among us. So what some of them would do, right? They would go out on a Sunday, the first day, and some of these jokers, they would try to like, you know, pile up enough for like a midnight snack. <laughs> and you know what happened, right? The next day, like the second day, Monday, guess what happened to that food? Anyone know? It stunk. But here what was amazing. When they gathered, when they stored extra on a Friday, on the sixth day, on the, on, 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 you know what happened on the seventh day? It, was, it, was, it was fresh as if it had just fallen. So what God was telling them is, I am giving you, I'm letting you do six days of work and you get seven days of blessings. I'm giving you six days of labor to labor and you get seven days where I provide for you. So God was teaching them someone bigger than you, someone more powerful than you is able to Take care of you. That's good news. And for 40 years, for 1,080 Sabbaths, they saw the miracle of God preserving them. God is just so awesome and amazing. They saw the miracle of God taking care of their needs so they can rest. So every week he was giving them a holiday. He loved them enough to take care of them, to be provider, and even of their basic need. You see, the, the, as I said, the Egyptian economy versus God's economy, that's what he was saying. That's the big difference. Because on the sixth day, you see, <laughs> Heaven's Bakery was shut down. So there was no manna falling on the, on, on the seventh day, sorry. <laughs> so he gave them enough, and it didn't last on a, on, a, on a Tuesday, on the third day. It didn't last on the fourth day. But on the sixth day, God kept that thing so that it did not spoil. That's rich stuff. That's rich stuff. So over and over again, he was teaching them, you could rest because I've got your back. You could rest because in six days, I provided for you for seven days. That's just good news. And in the process, they were understanding how deeply they were loved. You, you know what fascinates me about God? Well, a lot of things, but just one thing, is how intricately concerned he is for the minutest, that's not a word, by the way, guys. I just made it up. The minutest aspect of our lives. You know, some, sometimes you, you, you have a simple thing like a call, and you're like, God, I won't trouble you with it. No. He said, bring every little concern to me. You know? Bring every little concern. I, I got you, not just in the big thing, but the small thing. You, you ever read Matthew 10, 30, where Jesus says, the very hairs of your head, they're what? Numbered. They are numbered. So a group of scientists, right, you know what they did? They went and they counted how many strands of hair was on a human head. And they came up with 195,083. Now, to be honest with you, I think they just made up a big number. I think too. <laughs> because that was not going to be like the, like the 2000 elections in Florida. Ain't nobody was going to do a recount. <laughs> nobody was going to do a recount. <laughs> 195,083. But God did not say the hairs on your head are counted. 
You, you, you hear what I'm saying, Adam? Yeah. John, yeah. he said they are numbered. What does that mean? Every strand of hair on your head, God has a number on it. You know, so when you grow old and a couple falls off, God says, there goes number 556. <laughs> there goes number 557. You know, it's all numbered. That's how intricate God's care and compassion is for us. So let me tell you a few things about the Sabbath. Now, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. There are few things, there are probably three things, or four at most, commands about how to keep the Sabbath. Uh, the rest, church folks made it up. There's just a few things. One of them is, is real straightforward. Don't work. Don't, don't try to earn an income. Because you're, 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 you're messing up the fact that I'm trying to teach you that I can provide for you. You're messing up the fact that I gave you a system of six so that you can rest on the seven. You're, you're messing up the fact that for one day, let me be God. You know? So, so that is one. Just real straightforward. Don't look. It's real straightforward. But here's another one. Here's another one. It's found in Nehemiah chapter 10. And verse 31. Just a few. Just a few. And in Nehemiah 10 and verse 31, um, the Bible speaks about, Nehemiah speaks about people who were trying to sell goods on the Sabbath. And it annoyed the daylight out of Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, we will not buy or sell. On the Sabbath. So the, the, one of the second major rule is we, we don't we don't we don't buy ourselves. We don't exchange money. Because money is what makes us feel powerful. Money is what makes us feel like we're God. Money is what helps us that we call it the shots. I'm the man. That's what money does. And God is saying, no, no, give me a day so I can be God. So I can teach you that you can relax. And, and when you stop, the world don't stop spinning because you stop. He, he's teaching you to let go control of trying to own your own life. When you do, you run it down. You always do. You know what I mean? God is saying, let, let me do that thing. You know what happens when we have money? When you have money, you call the shots. You're like, when, you, when your pocket is fat, then like, like Beyonce, you could be like all the single ladies, all the single ladies. You know? And then a the woman, when they, when they purse is fat with money like Beyonce, they're like, to the left, to the left, to the left, you know? Just chase the guys away. Because like, oh, we have money! But money, again, is money is how we feel that we are in control. And God is saying, I got something better for you. And, and, and that's why it's so crucial. He doesn't want us to be like, you know, um, they're um, a deacon came to church one Sabbath, and in the parking lot, he saw the elder had a, elder had a truck, and had a for sale sign on it, and he found the elder in church, and he pulled him aside, and he said, look, elder, man, if it wasn't the Sabbath, I would ask you how much you sell in that truck for, and the elder said, but man, look, look, look. If it wasn't the Sabbath, I'll tell you twelve thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> and the deacon said, "Man, look, elder, look, it, it's, it's Sabbath, so we don't have business, but you can pick up the check from my office on Tuesday morning." You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it it, 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 when we negotiate and we buy and we sell, it's our way of being in charge. It's our way of being God. It's our way of controlling our own life. God said, "I have something better for you. As long as you're in charge, both you and God cannot be in charge." Both you and God cannot be in charge. Both you and God cannot call the shots as director of your life. At some point, you need to say, God, have thine own way. Here's a few more things about Sabbath, and then I'll, then I'll let you in on this, this sweet topic. Um, I used to struggle with the Sabbath. I'll tell you why I used to struggle. A lot of times, we keep the Sabbath like we're doing God a favor. Mm. You know? And at the end of Sabbath, we just, we have freedom, boy. You know? So when I, I used to be a really good Sabbath keeper. And, um, you know, in the islands, 
the sun sets at the same time, right? Always around 6 o'clock, every day. Um, we have no winter, spring, and summer, right? So it's just one climate. And, and, and you know, about 5.30, we'll start kind of, you know, wrapping up, keep the Sabbath. But let me tell you something. I moved to America in the summer. And y'all don't know this, but America is a strange place. <laughs> because in America, the sun don't set in the summer until like 8, 30. What kind of place is this? In the islands, summer, winter, everything. It's 6 o'clock. So you know, like 5.30, right? 5.30, I, I, I turn off my reggae music. You know, I'm preparing for the Sabbath. And I turn on my Fanny Crosby Blessed Assurance. <laughs> Almost as if we could switch off of the world and switch on to Jesus. Oh boy, what hypocrisy. So, so, so that was fine. So I was like celebrating the Sabbath like three hours before it began, right? That was cool. The problem was, could anybody guess what the problem was? Yeah. Yes! No? Sunset by 6 o'clock, 6.30, I was done. And when I went outside, the sun still was it's still high in the sky. You remember, you remember when Joshua 10? How Joshua told the sun to stand still? I'm like, that's terrible. Sun, go down. I was begging that thing. Go down. Stand still, my big toe. Go down, sun. And it really, it struck me like a ton of brick. I wasn't celebrating the Sabbath. I was just keeping 24 hours. I wasn't resting in the gift that God gave me to recharge my battery. This 4th of July, every week he gave me to, to, to recuperate and to celebrate his goodness and, 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 and to be blessed by uniting with believers. I, I, I lost out on that because I was, I was keeping the Sabbath like I was doing God a favor. Hear what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. He says the Sabbath was made for who? Man. Man. And not man for the Sabbath. What is that? Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is not for God. You know, we say it's God's Sabbath. That's not, it, it's for you. God himself said the Sabbath is for you. It's for your blessing, your renewal, your healing, your joy. You know, your recuperation is not for God to feel good. But it's for you to not work yourself to death trying to live. That's the joy of the Sabbath. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a trick about the Sabbath. One of the things I don't do on the Sabbath, I don't fast on the Sabbath. In fact, if I go to, if a church calls me to preach and they have fasting on that Sabbath, I skip out on them. I'm like, Sabbath has to be my Biggest meals. No fast. No Sabbath. You do that on Tuesday. Some other day, not Sabbath. Because the Bible says the Sabbaths are a feast. It ought to be the look, man. You ought to have the biggest party every Sabbath. It's a feast. You know, not a famine. But what happened is the Roman, the Romans tried to pull a trick on on, on, on the on the Christian people. Because the Christian people were, were, you know, this is like 2,000 years ago, right? Christian people were keeping the Sabbath and celebrating as, as God told, told, told us to in, in Exodus 20. And, and, and so what the Romans did now, they encouraged people to fast on the Sabbath. And they encouraged them to have their best meals on a Sunday. So growing up in the island, we had something called Sunday lunch. Mm -hmm. Sunday lunch was the best lunch of the week. That's when you'll, you'll make the, 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 the stewed chicken and the, you know what I mean, the, 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 you know, the real nice things that you didn't get during the week. So they made, they, by so doing, they made Sabbath a day of boredom. And they make Sunday a day to celebrate. You see? God is saying, uh-uh. You celebrate my Sabbaths. But I, I, have, I, have not, I have not been good with celebrating God's Sabbath. I remember my sister came. My sister works on a cruise ship. She used to work on a cruise ship. You know, and she'd travel, you know, my goodness. Every <coughs> month she was in a different continent sometimes. Or every six months or whatever it was. 
And so she came to spend a week or so by her brother, and she knows I, I, I celebrate the Sabbath, Friday sunset, Saturday sunset. And, and when she came, I told her all the things she could not do. Mm. Don't do that, don't do this, don't watch my TV. Don't. And, and when we came from church, every, every five minutes, she came to me and she's like, is the Sabbath finished? <laughs> is the Sabbath over yet? Is the Sabbath done? Every 10 minutes, she's like, is it done? <laughs> I'm like, God, you know, after she left, and she's only visited me once, I wonder why. <laughs> but, but after she left, it, it struck me. I made Sabbath a day of imprisonment. Right. I made it a bore, and a lot of us do that. And you know what's crazy? A lot of us do that, and then we tell people, in order to go to heaven, they have to do like us. Hell no! <laughs> I have to be as boring and as heavy-hearted like you in order to go to heaven? Yeah. And when some of us, we are so sour. You think we got baptized in lemon, you know what I mean? <laughs> sour. And we made the sour to bore. You know, it, it, you know what it should have been doing? Listen, she should have been begging me to, to keep Monday like I kept the Sabbath. And we, and we should have gone on hikes. We should have gone walking along the beach. I'm in California. You know what I mean? We should have had a blast on a Sabbath. But instead, I made it a drudgery. And I felt so bad how I represent. I made God look ugly. By this thing that he gave him for our joy, for our, 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 our freedom, I took it and I made it something ugly. And, and let me tell you something, family. That's why you ought to plan to make Sabbath a delight. Tomorrow you have like 24 hours, right? Plan to make this Sabbath one of the best days of the week. But it doesn't happen accidentally. Do you know that happiness is a choice? Do you all know that? Yes. Happiness, I mean, God don't put it in your cereal in the mornings. No. It's a choice you make. I learned that pretty early. You know, I'm thinking about my life, right? I'm blind. And... Sometimes I can just stay by myself and, and, and order a cake, light a candle, and throw a pity party. And wonder why aren't people taking me out, how come nobody loves me, poor blind me. I learned real early, you can't do that. Nobody's going to take you out. you you got to choose happiness for yourself. Nobody can make you happy. So you know what I used to do when I lived in California? I lived in Berkeley. I would take a bus and then a train and then another bus, like a two-hour one-way trip. And I would go visit my friend in Fairfield. And, and Pastor Mario knows about this. Uh, because he did it to me one time. And I would go bike riding. Now, if you are at home and you don't see, don't you ever try this. And I would go bike riding on my own bike. You remember I was telling you all the story, Russ? Oh, yeah. Bike riding on my own bike. And, and this is how it worked. I would ride, my friend would ride behind me. And he would say, left, right, pothole, light post. And then when he saw people coming, he'd ride up ahead and he'd tell them, blind man coming! And they would jump out the way and then start cheering me on. <laughs> Pastor Mario, am I making this up? And we'd, we'd ride along the freeway. I think Pastor Mario guided me once and I still came out alive. That's why I trust him. <laughs> still made it, you know what I mean? We went riding along the Sacramento River. <laughs> huh? Yeah, so, but, but look, it was a thrill. It was a joy. Because I chose to be happy. I could have stayed in my apartment and complained that nobody is tending to my needs. So you have to choose to be happy. It's a choice. It's a decision that you have to make. Stop waiting for someone to make you happy. So in the same way, you have to plan for Sabbath to be a day of joy. God gave it to you. Now you make it joyful. He's not going to make it joyful for you. He's not going to say, hey, five things to do on the Sabbath. <laughs> Go hiking up Mount Rubido in Lemoy Canyon. He's not going to tell you that. You got a brain. Hello, use it. <laughs> use it. One last thing, and then I, then I ask you to dive in. You know, you know, so Sabbath is the seventh day, but the seventh day begins when? Right. Right. It begins at, at sundown, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we get that. We didn't just make that up, right? We got that from the Bible because it says that the evening and the morning was what? 
On the first day. This is Genesis chapter 1. So day begins in the evening. And, and I like that because God wanted, the Romans switched it to midnight. Which is daggone confusing. God wanted when the day began for you to be alert. For you to welcome the day. You know? Sundown. But the Romans, they, they switched it to midnight, right? So this guy, he, he's telling me something. And he's like, Dex, 1 o'clock this morning, last night, I was walking. I'm like, dude, is it last night or this morning? Make up your mind. <laughs> That's how we get confused. You see what I'm saying? Confuse us. So I like God's idea. And it begins at sunset, at sundown, and you welcome the Sabbath. Not just the Sabbath, but every day with joy and gratitude that God did something special in your life.